uh, anthems related to each branch of the military, Coast Guard, Navy, Marines, Army, Air Force. And uh, this is in keeping with the principle of freedom through military victory. And after September 11th, this country did many things in the right way concerning freedom through military victory. And uh, finally, we even killed the perpetrator nearly 10 years after the attack. Now, we were attacked on September 11th. I remember that day vividly, as I'm sure any of you uh, of who were 13 or older at the time, you remember that day and what you were doing and what happened. I happened to be at work, working under a very, uh, well, a person who really didn't know what was going on that day. And it was a beautiful day. Even in the South, it wasn't as hot as usual. And I lived in South Carolina at the time. Just a crisp, clear day all up and down the East Coast. Now, I did not know that in New York City it was crisp and clear. Uh, and I received a phone call from my mother. And she said, a small plane just hit the World Trade Center. And I thought for a moment, and I was thinking of a prop plane. And uh, <clears throat> at the time, there was no television uh, where I was working, no access to media except for the radio, and they hadn't even mentioned it as of yet. So I thought about that prop plane, and I thought, well, maybe it was foggy, because uh, you're just not going to fly. I mean, those buildings are huge. You're not going to fly your plane and straight into a, a, the building unless you're psychotic, and that crossed my mind. Maybe uh, it was uh, the owner of a private plane who went psychotic or someone who stole a private plane who was psychotic and slammed it into the World Trade Center. <clears throat> and I had no idea it was a jet. No clue. And then uh, some time passed. I worked along and then uh, I received another call. A second plane hit the tower. Now at this point I knew it was terrorism or uh, some type of attack. And they stopped saying small plane, and then I realized it was uh, actually two airliners. Now, that changed the whole picture for me to go from small airplane to airliner. And then some people from across the hall printed out some pictures from the Internet uh, so we could see it in our department since we worked for a slave driver who wouldn't stop at any type of activity for any reason whatsoever. And uh, the second tower was hit, and I knew then something was up. It was a terrorist attack. I still didn't know how bad it was going to be. And uh, at that point, uh, the radio was playing, and they had uh, turned off their regular music. And then we heard the reporting of what was going on, constant reporting. And then uh, one of the ladies who worked there, her husband called her, and he said, the Pentagon has been hit. They attacked the Pentagon. It's on now. We're going to war. And she announced to everybody, my husband just said the Pentagon was hit. And I believed it, but uh, a, a lot of the people who were working, they had they didn't believe it. They wanted to hear it on the radio. They just thought he was shooting some bull. How in the world can the Pentagon be attacked? Don't they have missiles on top of that? Can't they eradicate any uh, enemy? After all, we're the United States. What in the world? The Pentagon, I, they just wouldn't believe it. And my boss said so. Oh, I don't know. That, that, that can't happen. And then, about two minutes later, it was announced on the radio, the Pentagon had just been hit. And at that point, everyone was in confusion. Our nation was obviously under attack. And uh, they went ahead and shut down all of the airline activity. And uh, they were saying on the radio there could be a pl uh, two or three, even four more planes left up in the air. They had no idea. And we were just waiting on where the next attack would occur. And then once the Pentagon was hit, well, that sent everyone into a tizzy. 
and they all uh, got up from their desk and walked outside. Now, I was new there, uh, so I sat there for a while, and I saw my boss just working along, and then I thought, well, then this guy came in from another department and said, what are you doing? What, what are you doing sitting here typing? Our country has just been attacked. So I got up, and you really can't think and work under a situation like that. So I got up and joined the crowd outside uh, who were smoking cigarettes to calm down, etc., because of the attack. And uh, shortly thereafter, we heard of the plane that went down in Pennsylvania. And then on break, I went outside and I looked up at the sky and there were no vapor trails. I'd never seen that in all my life. Every time I look in the sky, there's a vapor trail. There are jets going to and fro. But this time, crisp, clear, blue, no planes, and it was strange. It was surreal, almost like a movie. And then when I saw some of the images from New York City, it, it was definitely just like something out of Hollywood. It was just beyond our frame of reference as a country that something like this could happen. We were and are the United States of America. These things don't happen to us, but it did. And why? Well, it was a wake-up call as part of the cycles of discipline. And, by the way, both the first and second cycles of discipline have along with it sudden terror. And that is part of the first and second cycle of discipline. Sudden terror. And well, time has passed since then, but now guess what we have? Economic collapse. And things are not going to get better for quite a while if they're going to get better at all. I just have no idea. I'm not, I can't look into the future as a prophet. I can only observe historical trends. And I can tell by people's response or lack of response to Bible doctrine that nothing's changed. In fact, we're going farther and uh, farther away from the Word of God, or further and further. Farther has to do with distance. So we're further and further away from the Word of God in our mental attitude as believers in this client nation. As a result, God brings about the third cycle. And when I taught Bible doctrine in South Carolina, I would say, well, 9-11 didn't wake you up. Maybe when God hits your pocketbook or your wallet, then you'll wake up. Well, he did so, and conditions are the same. Where's the response? Where are the people who understand the need for the daily intake of the word of God? Now, in history, well, the history is cluttered with client nations who have gone up and then fallen. And it's something that occurs all throughout history. When we uh, went to Michigan, we went to a place called Holland, Michigan. Now, at one point, there was a pivot in uh, the Netherlands where uh, the city of Holland would be. But uh, what would happen in Europe is oftentimes the pivot was persecuted for being either Protestant or for not following Catholicism or whatever, or they would be deemed apostate when in fact they were not apostate. They were simply believing that it was faith alone in Christ alone, and they might not have known much about the spiritual life, but they knew it was faith alone in Christ alone, and uh, they maybe even knew a rebound and some other concepts that wouldn't be in those terms, but they still understood it. And uh, in that area, you can still see that it, it is part of the remnants of the pivot because in the uh, language that they speak there, Dutch, they had on the wall of a restaurant we went to a Bible verse, and that Bible verse uh, was... Uh, I forgot exactly what it said, but it was related to uh, something to do with happiness, combining with doctrine from the Old Testament. And uh, those are the vestiges or the leftovers of the pivot from the Dutch. But uh, one great thing about our country in its beginning 
is that the persecuted, the pivot, they all came here. The French Huguenots were part of the pivot in France. They moved to Charleston, South Carolina. The Dutch, who were part of a pivot, uh, or the Netherlands, and uh, they came to certain areas, such as Michigan. And uh, we had people all over Europe leave that place because they realized Europe had become dried up. So all of these uh, different uh, conglomerations of people came right to the United States and formed a very large pivot. And even before 1776, the United States of America, then known as the colonies, was far wealthier than any nation in the world. And many people in Europe became envious. And they would say, ah, oh, the American children are spoiled. They're just a rotten group of people. And to some extent, they were right in terms of there was no self-discipline at all in the colonies. Uh, they lived in a wilderness and did whatever they wanted, whatever they pleased. They lived under freedom like you can't imagine. And uh, one downside was lack of military. George Washington came along and he tried to muster up a military. And if you've ever read the book 1776 by David McAuliffe, you'll find out that uh, many of the uh, colonists who were called rebels by the British were, in fact, rebels. They were rebellious against the British, and they were rebellious against any authority in the land. And they even rebelled against George Washington's authority until finally they figured we're going to have to start shooting the people who abandon the military, and then they'll get the idea they can't do that anymore. And they did. But at first, it was a big mess. And it was nearly a miracle that we even won that war. In fact, it was. And the United States of America now is a client nation to God. It is, as it were, God's little miracle. And oftentimes we try to put emphasis on our system of government, which has degenerated from a republic to a democracy and now to socialism, or heading in that direct a quasi-socialist system, moving in that direction very rapidly. And as a result of the lack of a pivot, it's, a, it's at its smallest point ever, ever, in all of the history of the United States, yet there's still no nation like it. I guarantee you that. And we still have some divine establishment principles, including freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom for you to sit down and listen to me. And you take it for granted, but even in countries like Canada, just across the border, they have hate crime laws. I could not teach Bible doctrine there in the manner that I do here, uh, if I wanted to avoid being arrested, I would be arrested in Canada for hate speech. And that's, that's no joke. It's happened. And they have warned some Americans who are outspoken and controversial that if they come to Canada, they may be arrested for hate speech. And that's just a way to clamp down on freedom of speech. But they don't have the same constitution in Canada or in Mexico or in Europe even. Uh, not even in the United Kingdom, where we received a lot of these principles. They don't have it now. There are hate crime laws in, in uh, Great Britain and all across Europe, and they're trying to force that upon the citizens of the United States. And if that ever occurs, then you've lost both your freedom of speech and, consequently, freedom of religion because people have to speak when it comes to the word of God and teaching it. Well, we are definitely in rapid decline. And now, since we did not respond, oh, we responded emotionally to the 9-11 attack. And everybody ran to church. But the church didn't have any answers. And the churches that did have answers were ridiculed. And uh, I'm, I won't even mention some of the things that I know. But uh, even some so-called doctrinal pastors ridiculed the notion that this nation was under the cycles of discipline. 
and it, it was then, with sudden shock, sudden terror, and it is today with economic collapse. And it has been a total economic collapse. I don't know if any of you have ever been through Detroit. I just went along the outskirts of it the other day, and it's a mess. There are buildings emptied out with the graffiti all over them, and they are just rotting. And that's been in 10 years' time. They just sit there and rot, and they already look like Roman ruins. In fact, worse than Roman ruins, those Roman ruins have lasted for 2,000 years and still standing, and some of them some of which are still quite beautiful. But uh, that just goes to show how our buildings compare to the Roman buildings. In 10 years, they're already rotted out. A thousand years, forget it. They would, collide, they would crumble. They wouldn't be there. But the whole, uh, a lot of uh, major portions of what used to be a great industrial city, gone, abandoned, full of crime, full of poverty. In fact, if, if I were to go and take pictures in certain areas of Detroit, you would say, where are you? What third country are, what third world country are you in? The United States! Now why should something so terrible occur? And it's really pathetic. Well, there's a lot of reasons we could point to divine establishment, but the main reason why, there used to be a pivot in the north, and it's gone. There is no more pivot. You can see remnants of it. And you can see where the great uh, majestic churches were built, etc., but apostasy took hold. And so we see the decline of Detroit, and that's a perfect picture of what America will look like if there is not a turnaround in volition toward becoming positive toward the Word of God. It could occur. There could be a turnaround. We're not finished yet. We still have more freedom in those areas, freedom of speech and religion, than anywhere else in the world. And we still are a client nation, and we still are the uh, custodians of the Word of God. Nowhere else has it taught, except right here in the United States. There was a man I heard from the United Kingdom who was teaching Bible doctrine. He was ran right out of his own country. He came to the United States and he said, there's just nothing. It's all dried up in the United Kingdom. It used to be Great Britain where the sun never set on their empire. But now they're just an island country. Why? They lost their pivot. They're not a client nation anymore. The pivot came to the United States. And in fact, from statistics, only 2% of the population of the United Kingdom goes to church on Sunday only. And of that 2%, it's all apostate teachings. And in the United Kingdom, it's not the same as here. And sometimes we like to look at Europe and say, they're free too. No, they're not. They're, they are not. They have degenerated and declined so fast. And for some reason, we want to follow in their footsteps. They've declined so fast that China is now promising to bail out Europe. Now that's upside down. And this is what occurs when you lose a pivot. History is turned upside down in the wrong direction. In the past, Europe colonized China, colonized Africa, colonized the world, and brought divine establishment principles to the world and the gospel. And I know if you're in college, your liberal professors always talk about empire as something evil and terrible and harsh. But it wasn't. The British Empire, wherever they went, there was benevolence, even in the United States. And they couldn't understand why we were so rebellious, because we were under the protection of a client nation. But that's part of history and part of Jesus Christ controlling history. But in India, 
They received the gospel and they rejected it over and over again. And they were colonized. In China, they were colonized by the British and the British missionaries brought them the gospel and they rejected it. And to Africa they went and many responded in Africa for a while. And there are Christians in Africa. There is also a great number of Muslims in Africa. But they responded for a while and then once the British were kicked out, they have gone apostate as well. And that was their only chance uh, to really make it uh, was after the British left, they, if they would have stuck with doctrine, they would have made it. Places like South Africa. But they didn't stick with doctrine. They went away from doctrine as soon as the British left. And so they destroy themselves just as we destroy ourselves. And this is where we come across the doctrine of the client nation, of which we are one. So we need a definition. What is a client nation? A client nation is a, is a national entity under the patronage of God. It is assigned the responsibility for the formation, preservation, communication, and fulfillment of the canon of scripture. And nowhere else in the world would, will you find a clear presentation of the epistles of the post-salvation epistles. Nowhere else will you find post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation than right here in the United States. And if they're doing it in another country, it's because it originated right here in the United States. So we're still a client nation. We still have custodianship of the word of God. I know of no one else around the world who teaches doctrine. That is, oh, there may be a few, I just don't know of them. But uh, most of it, we are the custodians. I do know of Helmut Mueller, who's a missionary, and he lives in Germany, or originated from Germany, and he goes to Africa, oftentimes on missionary journeys. And he's a great missionary from Germany, but still, where did he receive his doctrine? The United States. So we are the client nation, the custodians of the word of God. Now, before Israel became a client nation, custodianship of the word of God involved divine revelation apart from scripture. Why? They didn't have scripture. Moses was the first to begin writing scripture from Genesis onward. But before Moses, there was no scripture. Before Israel, there was no scripture. But when Israel became a nation, it was involved in the authorship, the custodianship, and the dissemination of the word of God. Of the written word, in fact. Additional custodianship was assigned to Israel in the formation of the New Testament. All of the writers... Of the epistles were Jews, Jews save two. Luke was not a Jew. He was Gentile, but he was Paul's best friend. And we know Luke wrote Acts, which we're studying now, and also Luke. So, except for two writers, all of the uh, persons who wrote the New Testament were Jews. Why? Even under the fourth cycle of discipline. They were the custodians of the word of God. Now, during the time of the formation of the New Testament, the client nation changed from Judea in August of 70 AD to the Roman Empire. And Judea had to be destroyed because of their great apostasy in the area of religion. And if Israel, you say, well, wouldn't God give Israel a pass? No. God is righteous, just, and he does everything with perfect fairness. And even though the Jews were God's chosen people, and even though our Lord wept over Jerusalem, it didn't matter. The integrity of God had to intervene. For if the church in Jerusalem was allowed to continue, nothing but legalism would have existed around the world. Nothing but religionism. 
the gospel would have been clouded and there would have never been any type of revivals anywhere around the world. So the apostasy had to be wiped out and it was in August of 70 AD in a very dramatic way. In Exodus 19, 4 through 6, we have a reference to the client nation concept, and it does have application for today. That's why in Acts it says, this is the time of the Gentiles. In the Old Testament, it was the time of the Jew. And since it's the time of the Gentiles, what's that mean? It means it is the time of Gentile client nations. And anyone who departs from that, and I know of some pastors who are popular and are receiving a lot of ears, itching ears, it's not where you need to go. If they don't teach the five cycles of discipline, if they don't teach the doctrine of the client nation, they're not, uh, they, they're, they're missing a huge portion of what it's all about. They are missing out on what blessing by association is all about. And that continues, it's transdispensational. Blessing by association goes through all the dispensations, not just the church age. In fact, it was in Israel. David had influence upon Israel 400 years after he died. And David had that influence as family of God. Imagine how much greater our influence is as royal family of God. And it is. It's unseen, but it's greater. And to whom much is given, much is expected. And we have a sorry group of believers. And Believers today are so goofy. All they do, they think about sin. They compare their sins to someone else's sins. They say, my sins aren't as overt as someone else's sins, so my sins are kind of hidden, so I'm better than so-and-so. So-and-so does something that is so egregious, so visible, that it's gross, and uh, then you sit in judgment, you're gross too. In fact, you're grosser if that's even a word, worse than. And we know the sins of self-righteousness and judging and maligning are the worst of sins, not only from Proverbs, but also from the fact that the Apostle Paul, as an unbeliever, as Saul of Tarsus, said, I am the chief of all sinners. What did it to him? Religion. Being good, or what he thought was being good. And he did it better than anyone else. If you want to find the most goody two shoe person in history, go no further than Saul of Tarsus. And he was so wrapped up in himself and self righteousness, he had to be blinded before he would accept the gospel. So in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, it states this You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if hearing, you will obey my voice, that is, obey Bible doctrine, and keep my covenant. There was a conditional covenant with Israel. If Israel would follow the law, then blessing would come. And that was the covenant to Israel. We have a new covenant today. Then you shall be my own possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. Then you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to me. A kingdom of priests. Now that has uh, quite a bit of meaning. Because we are a kingdom of priests. But in First Peter, it mentions that we are Royal priests, greater than what they had in the Old Testament, and yet there's no response, or very little. There's some response. And what response I've seen, it's been few and far between, but I don't care. I'm not looking for numbers. I'm looking to be a lean, mean, spiritual machine, that is the congregation, those who listen to me. Those who call them, themselves my sheep. We're going to be a lean, 
mean spiritual machine. You get into large congregations today and there's something wrong. Now that's not necessarily always true through history, but during times of apostasy, if you see a large congregation, you see apostasy. Now, during times of revival, that could totally change to where a doctrinal pastor could have a large congregation, but that's not the issue for the pastor. The pastor must teach the word of God and keep it clear and delineate principles and mechanics, especially mechanics for the church age, because it's so far above and beyond our regular frame of reference. They are spiritual in nature, and it cannot be understood apart from the mechanics of the unique spiritual life. Now, therefore, if hearing, that is, who hears? Those who sit down and listen to the word of God in the church. Now, if hearing, now that has to do with anybody can come in and listen. And you know, there's a lot of garbage out there among so-called doctrinal pastors. They say, well, you have to have face-to-face -face teaching. Now, that's not found nowhere in scripture. Nowhere. That's legalism. And a little yeast leavens the whole loaf. And you say, well, it's a little bit. No, it's quite a bit. Because if an unbeliever can do it, it's not the unique spiritual life. An unbeliever can sit down face to face and look at a pastor. A pastor who says you need to be face to face with him is so arrogant that he thinks you must look at his beautiful face in order to perceive the word of God. Now, isn't that arrogance? You don't have to look at my face. In fact, I would prefer you you don't. But if you ever were to, that's it's not an issue. You say, well, why are there local congregations? Well, that's how it started in the beginning because there was, there was no internet. There was no way of communication outside of putting people into one group where they could listen. But the purpose was listening. The purpose wasn't to be in a group. The purpose wasn't for so-called Christian fellowship, Christian social intercourse. It wasn't for that. They gathered in one place so they could hear, so they could all hear it once, and so that the reader could pronounce it at once and not have to teach it or read it to several people coming in at whatever time they wished. Now with technology, you can listen to this at whatever time you wish once it's published. And that's what's so wonderful about technology. But you always have to remember in Hebrews 10.25, the heat, the, in the Greek, you have to remember the purpose clause. And it's, it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Why? You see, immediately, believers, negative toward the word, they never ask why. They'll just see the a commandment. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. They don't ask why. They don't know why. In fact, they're not learning any doctrine themselves. In fact, they may, they forsake the assembling of themselves together every day, except maybe Sunday and sometimes even Sunday. And yet they sit in judgment of others who may listen by other means, internet, tapes, CDs, MP3s, television, whatnot, radio. And that's because they do not understand the purpose. They understand the command. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And they grab hold of that command and turn it and warp it into legalism. That's not the command. The command is for a purpose. And the reason... At that time, they should not have forsaken the assembling of themselves together is because it was the only way to learn Bible doctrine for the purpose of exhortation. And who gives the exhortation? The pastor. You don't have the gift of exhortation. It doesn't exist anymore. It did exist in some form in the pre-canon era because of deficiencies. 
and the pastor teacher comes along, and he is the one in authority who exhorts. No one else has that right. And also when it says assemble yourselves together, it's, it provides privacy and an impersonal setting. It doesn't say go one-on-one -on -one with your pastor and figure out what you need to do with your life, does it? Yet that's what they're doing today. God set that up so that you could assemble in privacy and get your toes stepped on, if you know, we all do. And to make correction, it's for reproof and correction. We all need to make correction. I need to make correction. There's a, and there's no one among us who doesn't need to make correction and who does not need to be corrected. But I don't need to be corrected, neither do you, by someone else. By your pastor, yes, but it's impersonal. He should never come up to you and say, I see the way you've been living your life, and I am really not pleased with it. Now, what kind of arrogant fool is that? It's hard enough living your own spiritual life and having to stick your nose into someone else's business simply because they have a different area of weakness than you do. Or maybe that you might even have the same area of weakness, but you have gone into fragmentation. And you fragment it so much so that you will criticize someone for the same sins you commit. And, at the, and that means you go into judging too. So you fragment it. And you have polarized fragmentation, which means you're both a legalist, one who judges, and you also perform the same sins, or perform, I guess that's a wrong way to put it, commit the same sins as someone else, although I guess you can perform some sins. And you may commit the same thing, but still you want to judge and criticize and malign and whisper. What gives you the right? Who made you a master? And that's the problem with Client Nation USA. Too many people with their eyes on people, with their eyes on self, with their eyes on things, so that they have no capacity for life, for love, for happiness. And that's what's destroying us. And so you forsake not the assembling of yourselves together for the purpose of exhortation. The pastor does the exhorting. And there is no one another. If you look in your English Bibles, you will see in italics one another. Why is it in italics? Because it's not part of the original language. It means it was added by some arrogant person who thought that being together with a bunch of believers was how you grow spiritually, and it's not. In fact, Christian fellowship, at best, at best, it's, uh, well, Christian fellowship, at best, would be social intercourse between two like-minded believers, at best. At worst, it is gossip maligning, judging, destroying each other. So if hearing, anyone can hear, unbelievers can listen, but uh, you have to obey. Obey what? Doctrine, that's my voice. And keep my covenant, referencing at this point in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, it's referencing the covenant between God and Israel. Today, it's the covenant, the new covenant that we follow related to the epistles so, therefore, post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. Then you shall be my own possession among all peoples. That's client nation. And that's client nation USA. We are God's own possession among all peoples. And I know that to be 100% accurate. You step foot outside of this country. You step foot into a whole new world. And if there is any prosperity in the world, it's because it has emanated from the pivot right here in the United States. Period. Over and out. So my own possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Then you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to me. What's holy mean? It doesn't have to do with any type of self-righteous notions that you may have come up with. Holy to you might mean abstaining from sex, even normal activity, 
That's not holy. That's stupid. At the, and, and in terms of being married and abstaining from sex. Or some people think they're holy because they abstain from certain activities, smoking cigarettes or uh, drinking. That would be in moderation. But you see, holy means set apart. A kingdom of priests and a set apart nation to me. And I believe you me, the United States of America has been set apart. Oh, I mean, you can even just cross any of our borders, the one with Mexico and the one with Canada, and immediately you can see we are set apart, different, blessed. And any blessing you see on the other side, all provided by God in association with the client nation, with those nations friendly to the United States, they are blessed. The United Kingdom has been blessed because of their friendly relationship to the United States. Israel has been blessed because of their friendly relationship to the United States. Because we are the client nation. Israel is not. Deuteronomy 7.6 For you are a holy people, once again set apart. For you are a set apart people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. That's the United States. I remember going to Washington, D.C. And a mother was trying to teach her son, and the only way a mother can do very wonderfully in most cases, in explaining the word of God to a child in a manner in which the child can understand it. And she was explaining to the child in her own language, in her own words, how special the United States is. And she was pointing out all the beautiful monuments to her son, her young son. And she said, all of these beautiful monuments, all of this, they mention God, and they do. I don't know if you, how many of you have been to Washington, D.C., but if you go into any of the monuments, you see the vestiges of a pivot or what used to be a large pivot. God is mentioned everywhere. And uh, nowadays, now the Ten Commandments are related to Israel, but they are also divine establishment related to thou shalt not steal private property. Thou shalt not murder the value of volition and life. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The value of a man owning a woman, as it were. Now, you don't like to hear that, ladies, I understand. And in the church age, it's not so much owning as it is you're just under the authority of the man. Period. I can't, I didn't write these things. I couldn't, I couldn't have made them up myself. I'm not, myself, I'm not smart enough. There's just no way. It's just the way it is. And if, if I could change it, believe you me, I would, because with authority comes responsibility. The husband is responsible for keeping everything in line in the family and the keeping the finances in order, etc. And making sure everything is uh, on the up and up uh, to provide, etc. And so that's the responsibility. Now, nowadays, it has been flipped on its head, and I understand there are more women working today than men, and that's because they're in areas where uh, men usually don't work, and they haven't been hit so hard. Construction, you don't see very many women working in construction, and that's where, that's what gets hit, that's, that is what get, gets hit first. And one way I know we are going to have a double dip recession, we are, is because construction goes down first and it has fallen off a cliff in the past few months. So we're going to have a double dip recession. In other words, uh, when people look back in history, they're going to say this is a great recession or a great depression. But I don't know as of yet as to whether people will, t will turn around and turn toward Bible doctrine and go back to the establishment principles. Deuteronomy 26, 18 through 19. And the Lord has today declared you to be his people, a people for his own treasured 
possession, as he promised you. Therefore, you are to keep all his commandments. Now, this was to Israel under a different covenant. And they had commandments we don't have today. As royal priests, we have certain commandments that are totally different and superior to the commandments in the Old Testament. Such as the command to have love produced by God the Holy Spirit. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. They had love your neighbor as yourself. But they didn't have love being produced by God the Holy Spirit. Or the unique spiritual life itself being produced by God in you. Being produced by God the Holy Spirit. It's his production. You can't do it without the filling of the Spirit. And it's not really you doing it. You're, you're making a choice. And then the power of God the Holy Spirit shines through. And, does, and he does the work. Grace. You were saved by grace. We live by grace. So. He will set you high above all nations which he made for praise, fame, and honor. And that you shall be a set-apart people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. Now, if you've never been anywhere outside of this country, I understand. A lot of people don't get the opportunity to travel. A lot of people have never been to Europe. I haven't been to Europe. But a lot of people have never even been to Canada or Mexico. A lot of some people have never even been out of their locale. And that is especially true in small towns uh, where uh, people get settled. They like where they live. They don't really have a desire to go anywhere else. They're in their routine. They don't really make enough money to go on vacation. They don't even want to save for it. It's just not something they want to do. And they're comfortable in their own frame of reference, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be a world traveler to understand these things. But I can tell you, wherever you go, there's American influence, American movies, American music. They don't even have their own music. Well, then you say, what about Mexico? Well, yes, they do have a great deal of Spanish influence. But still, if you go to Mexico, you will hear Americans singing on the radio. You go to Europe, that's all they have. And if you, I have, just out of curiosity, listen to some radio stations in the United Kingdom. And they'll mix it up a little, and they'll have some of their own people sing, and it's horrible. And then they'll have the Americans come along, and you say, now that is American. That's professional. That sounds great. That's wonderful. Beautiful. Awesome. Set apart. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. In other words, the next generation must come along and become part of the pivot of mature believers. Otherwise, it's all over. And we still have residual blessing by association from previous generations. My generation, Generation X, we're hopeless so far. Could it change? Maybe. The generation of the hippies, they actually turned out to be one of the most positive generations in this nation's history. And that sounds strange to you, but it's true. If you ever went to Baraka Church uh, during, well, let's say the 60s and 70s, you saw about the same age of people. Uh, in the, who were around in the 60s. They were teenagers in the 70s. They were in their 20s and 30s. And that's who attended Baraka Church. Oh, there were a few gray-haired people here and there. But it was mainly the generation, the Vietnam generation, Vietnam War generation. The other generation was too legalistic. They couldn't handle that. And the younger generation, well, they're not legalistic. They're just, uh, well, they're fragmented. Both judging and committing the same sins that they judge. And some of them are amoral, meaning they don't really have any. They don't even know, oftentimes, living with somebody to, for someone in my generation, that is, 
That's so common. It's not thought of as... Now, in the past, it was looked down upon. Now, living together, well, most people say you should do that before you get married, just to see if it's going to work out. But that is not the way God set it up. You might think that's smart from human viewpoint. Well, I'll live with this person for a while. If I don't get along, I'll just up and leave. It makes it a little easier, you say, and all that is true from the human viewpoint. But you could have had something. You might have had something great if you followed the principles, both of you, man and woman. And if you both followed the principle to get married and to go from that point, you may have had something great, but you might have ruined it by living together first. You might have totally destroyed something that would have been wonderful from your own volition. And it is a true statistic. People who have lived together first and then get married have a much, much higher divorce rate than those who do not live together and get married and then live together. You say, why? Well, it's God's divine establishment principle. That's how he set it up. Not to be some cruel ruler with all these rules. God is more for freedom than any man on the face of the earth. He only set up these this system because he knows it's for our benefit. It's not even for his benefit. And, you, and you're not, uh, well, if you were to follow the rules, exactly. And unbelievers can do this as far as following the divine establishment rules. If you were to follow the divine establishment rules exactly as an unbeliever, there's blessing in it. You will be blessed in your job. You'll be promoted because you work hard. You will be blessed in your marriage. That is, if you make a good choice and the other person is an unbeliever as well, following the same principles. This doesn't occur so much today, but it has occurred in the past in this his- in our history. And uh, the, the, there are unbelievers. Do you know the divorce rate is higher in the South than in the North? That might shock you. Do you know there's more crime in the South than in the North? That might shock you. Why? There are more unbelievers in the North than in the South by far. By far. But when you uh, go into the North, there are people, unbelievers, they get married. They have a job they enjoy. They have a family. And then they die and go to hell. That's all found in Ecclesiastes. So Deuteronomy 26, 18 through 19, and the Lord has today today declared you to be his people. And this is where we have been set apart for praise, fame, and honor. And when you see a client nation come under great attack, and when you see a client nation to the point to where wherever the person goes, they are disrespected. For example, I have a passport, and in the passport it says that the country that accepts uh, me into their land should uh, give some partiality to me because I am a citizen of the United States. In fact, the opposite occurs now. I mean, it's just a piece of paper that says that. We don't enforce it. You can go to any country in Europe, and they hate us, and they may mock you. So the Gentile client nation category follows exactly the same pattern as Israel. But there are some dramatic differences. And that's related to the fact that we're in the church age. That we have grace provision. That we have a unique spiritual life to live. Now, I won't do closing prayer. And we will just uh, continue in the next hour after a short break.